in the sense that uh, we knew it's something about its scale of proximal operators. So proximal Newton, remember, basically made a quadratic expansion to G, where it actually used the full Hessian of G in the quadratic term, kept H untouched, and it found the direction that looked best according to this expanded um, combination, right? Expanding G into a quadratic and then keeping H as it is. So that, that I'm calling DK on the slide. And then uh, we just move in that direction by some amount of TK. And the pure proximal Newton would take TK equal to 1, so we actually will be just taking like a step that minimizes the uh, quadratic approximation, but of course we usually use backtracking. And so the, the high level summary was that the iterations here are, are typically very expensive because um, computing this thing is actually usually a fairly sophisticated optimization routine on its own. Um, but we have the convergence of Newton in terms of um, per iteration progress. Okay, so we, we typically think about uh, needing very few iterations until we get the convergence to high accuracy. So that was just a high level um, recap of proximal Newton. So, um, yeah, so last time at the very end I went over uh, Polymnet, which is a particular implementation of proximal Newton for the case when G is a, um, a negative block likelihood from an exponential family and H is a separable penalty. And I went over it pretty quickly. Um, I looked back at what I wrote and I thought it was almost unreadable in my handwriting. So uh, I wanted to just see if people, did people want to hear that again? I can go over that again now in more detail. Or do we want to just skip that? I'm completely open to either. So let's just do a show of hands if people want to hear that again. And who wants to just move forward to um, dual methods? Okay, so maybe what I'll do is, since it's about even, I'll see if we have time at the end, and I'll, and I'll do it in more detail then. Otherwise, stop by my office hours, um, or I could point you to some literature on this paper if you're curious, or this, you know, this kind of class of methods. Okay, um, so just a reminder, uh, the, the important concept for today, as we jump into dual methods, is um, this concept called the conjugate function. Javier covered this in the, in the dual methods unit, or sorry, the dual duality optimality unit. Uh, and given a function f, we define its, its convex conjugate f star um, by the maximum difference between, at a point y, between a linear function, right, and y, and our function itself. So it's the maximum, um, oh no, I covered this, I'm sorry. I, I, I've gotten mixed up, who covered that lecture, it doesn't matter, but it's the maximum uh, overall x of y transpose x minus f of x. Okay, it's called the conjugate, or sometimes the convex conjugate, to emphasize the fact that this function is always convex, regardless of um, the convexity of f itself. Okay, we also saw in this uh, unit that conjugates often appear in the context of dual problems. And that's because if we just if we just uh, apply a minus sign to both sides of this equation, means the negative conjugate of f at y is equal to the minimum over all x of f of x minus y transpose x. And if you look at this, what does this look like? This looks like a piece of the Lagrangian that we minimize a little bit. Right? That might be a piece of the criterion, and we would get such a thing from an inequality or an equality constraint right, um, on the variable x. So that would be a piece of the Lagrangian, and minimizing out over x would give us a piece of the dual function. Okay, so um, that's why they often appear in, in dual programs. Uh, some important properties, especially important for today. In fact, um, this is going to be like the driving identity for today um, is that if f is closed to convex, then the following holds. So the, the first thing we can notice if f is closed to convex is that taking two conjugates gives us back the original function. And more importantly, we have this relationship between subgradients of f and subgradients of f star. Okay, so the, the property that holds when f double star is equal to f for when f is closed and convex, is that um, x being a subgradient of f star at y is equivalent to y being a subgradient of f at x. Okay, and, and both of those in turn are equivalent to x achieving the minimum, okay, in this minimization function. So x actually achieves the minimum here written over z, over all z of f of z minus y transpose z. Okay, so those three statements are equivalent. I don't think we proved that in the homework or in class. Um, can you guys 
nod your head if we actually did. I don't remember doing that. So I guess we didn't. Um, so I have a short sketch of the proof actually here. Um, so we'll go through that. Okay, we'll, we'll just sketch out why that's true. It's actually fairly simple. Um, but first, let us just remark the following. If f is strictly convex, okay, then if you go to this minimization problem, what do we know about this minimization problem when f is strictly convex? I can use some cheering up. What do we need to be What do we know about the minimization problem when f is strictly convex? About the solution, for example. So unique. Unique, yeah, great. So a unique solution, which means that there's only one x that minimizes it. There's only one x that minimizes it, which means that there's only one x that's in the sub-differential of f star at y, which means that f star is actually differentiable. Okay, and it's, and it's gradient is the minimizer. Okay, so that's actually another very important property. So if f is strictly convex, I don't want to have an f here, if f is strictly convex, then it's f star is differentiable and its gradient actually achieves the minimum. Okay, that, that just came from the sequence of covalences. All right, um, so let's go through the proof details real quick. So what we're going to show uh, first is that x being a subgradient of f star of y is equivalent to y being a subgradient of f of x. And we're going to, like I said, assume that f is closed and convex. So we'll, we'll just do one direction. The other direction is going to essentially follow in the same way. Okay, so let's assume that Uh, I think I started with this direction. Y is the subgradient of f at the point x. Okay, then what that means is, let's look at this problem. It's a minimum, let's say, over all z of f of uh, z minus um, z transpose y. Okay, so let's look at this problem. Minimize over all z, f of z minus z transpose y. How do I characterize optimality in this problem? Well, I take the subgradient of the criterion with respect to z, right, and set it equal to zero. So that means that um, a point, let's say, uh, z is optimal if the following holds. Um, zero is in the subgradient of f at z minus y. Because the, uh, this is differentiable and its, it's gradient is just y with respect to z. Or in other words, right, we're saying that an optimal z must satisfy this. So any z that minimizes this criterion must satisfy this. This is equivalent to saying that y must be in the subgradient of f of z. So optimal point z satisfy this. Okay, but we're assuming actually that um, this is true for x, right? So therefore, we know that um, x must minimize, uh, you know, f of z minus z transpose y over z. It must actually achieve the minimum here, right? Or equivalently, it must maximize uh, z transpose y minus f of z over z. Okay, so that's all I've said here. X is in the set m of y, which just means it's the set of maximizers of this function, z transpose y minus f of z over z. This came from subgrading optimality. But now let's remember what f star was by definition. f star by definition is the max itself. Okay, it's the maximum value. That's actually the definition of f star. And what do we remember about subgradients of functions that are defined as pointwise maximum of other functions? Okay, this is a function. It's defined as the pointwise maximum of this function. What do we remember about subgradients of those? So the subgradient is gotten by, right? at a point y, taking something kind of complicated in, in generality, the closure of the convex hollow, but this stuff doesn't really matter at the moment, 
closure of the convex file of the union of all points um, of all functions, okay, in here that maximum that achieve the maximum. So we can all we can say all z such that uh, z achieves the max of the subgrade of this thing with respect to y, right? Because we're thinking about this as a maximum of functions of y. So what's what's the subgrade now with respect to y? Just z. Okay, so we can see that actually the subgradient of f star of y, it contains all the points z that achieve the max. Right? Just by our rule for subgradients. It contains all the points z that, contain, that achieve the max. And hence x in particular achieves the max. So x is going to be in the subgradient of f star of y. The only tricky part was just remembering somehow with respect to what we have to take subgradients. Okay, up here with respect to z, because we're thinking about the optimal, um, the optimality conditions for this problem. Z is the variable. Down here with respect to y, because we are thinking about this as something like this. It's the maximum over all z of some functions, let's just call them h sub z of y. Okay, and in our um, notion for how we take subgradients of maximal functions, what we do is we take subgradients of these things with respect to y for the values of z of which this guy, uh, this guy is equal to the max. Which is what we've done here. Okay, and so subgradient with respect to y is just z. Okay. Um, interrupt me if you, have, if you are confused or you have questions. Otherwise, I'll just proceed with the other direction. So that was one direction. Okay, for the other direction, so let's say this was um, not a direction where we're going to be assuming that uh, x is in the subgradient of f star of y. This direction is really, really short. So what do we know from up here? So then from what we know above, we can conclude that y is in the subgradient of the conjugate of this function at y. Right? That's exactly what we oops, excuse me, the x. We just proved that if, if you know something's in the subgrade of f at x, we reverse the roles of, of these two and we put a conjugate on it, and we get that you know the other one is in the sub is in the subgrade of the conjugate at the first one. Well on the same idea here, but to the function f star. So we reverse the roles of x and y, and we realize that y must be in the subgrade of the conjugate of the conjugate at x. But now we're done, right? But um, we're done because f star star is equal to f by assumption. Okay, so that was proving the equivalence of these two. That was actually made it much, much simpler. Instead of somehow looking at the, looking at this and worrying about whether the closure and the convex fall actually give us everything, that would have been much more complicated to argue this route. Once you know that it's closed and convex, we just somehow reverse our our um, arguments and then I'm sorry, we apply the same arguments and then realize that actually we we finished because we have the f star star is equal to f. Okay, so that was proving this property, this first equivalence here. The second equivalence is actually already shown. You just maybe didn't quite realize it yet, if you haven't seen that. That's what we showed up here. So along the way, we showed that uh, you know x must minimize this function over z. And then uh, the other direction essentially proves that that is true in the other direction as well. So we, we've gotten this along the way. Okay, but in other words, you can actually see directly this is true by differentiating this with respect to z and using subgrade and optimality. I'm right, taking the subgrade with respect to z. And we already did this, this one, I think, in words. Okay, that is strictly convex, and this problem has a unique minimizer, and then it must actually be the gradient of f star of y. Because 
Then we conclude the subdifferential of F star only contains one element, which implies that F star is differential. And that's the gradient. Okay, so really important um, properties there. So let's see, um, we're going to see why that's so useful when we talk today about uh, something that people may be generically call dual methods, or more precisely, they call them dual gradient methods or even dual subgradient methods. And then we'll, we'll see that that leads to something called dual decomposition, um, and we'll, we'll kind of move towards ADMM. So we'll talk about something called the method of um, augmented Lagrangians, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of define ADMM and peak at why, why it's useful. And then next lecture on Monday, I guess, we'll do a much more thorough treatment of ADMM. So here, here's the maybe motivation for where we'll start today. Um, practical motivation, let's say. Let's suppose that we can't derive the dual equals form. Okay, is that it? Do we have to essentially give up on, say, using the dual for some algorithmic purpose? Because just because you can't derive the conjugate of the dual of f in closed form. So we're going to see that based on this rule we just learned, it doesn't mean that everything's hopeless. We can still proceed in some way to optimize the dual, even if we don't know the conjugate um, in closed form. Okay, so as an example, let's just start with this simple uh, equality constraint minimization problem. Let's want to minimize a function f of x subject to ax equals b. And we're going to assume this guy is complex, okay, so that we have strong duality. We can think about the primal dual of things equivalent. So the dual problem, okay, this is something I won't go through the calculation of. You should um, check that this makes sense to you. The dual problem, if you were to set up the Lagrangian and minimize, or just to, to kind of use the property of conjugates that we've already learned, think of this as a case, a special case of tensile duality. Okay, is to maximize over all uh, u, u being the, the multiplier of this equality constraint, the negative conjugate of f evaluated at minus a transpose u minus b transpose u. Okay, so a pretty simple calculation brings us from the primal here to the dual here. And this guy f star is the conjugate of f. So let's suppose we actually don't know what f star is explicitly, okay, but we're still interested in optimizing this. Um, what could we do? Well, we could think about maybe the most generic method possible, which is subgradient ascent. Okay, or, or subgradient ascent method or something, because we want a new maximization here. This is convex. Let's see if we can take a subgradient and then move in the direction of that subgradient. Usually we think about, you know, minimizing, so we're moving in the direction of the negative subgradient. Here we're actually maximizing, right? So we're moving in the direction of a subgradient. So how do we do that? Well, first let's just define some notation. Let's define this function to be g of u. Or actually, it's negative g of u. Okay, so it's f star of minus h transpose u. And for the um, subgradients of g at a point u, by the essentially like the chain rule for subgradients, right? This is minus a times subgradients of f star at minus h transpose u. Remember this rule from some of the calculus we defined for subgradients. Okay, so it's left basically to find subgradients of f star, and once we do that, we can just multiply by minus a to get subgradients of g. Okay? But we know what subgradients of f star is, at least we can characterize them, because remember, we already said that um, right, subgradients of f star, we can characterize by essentially reversing the roles here and thinking about subgradients of f, which in turn is equivalent to some minimization property. Right? Let's just go back to this. Subgradients of f star are from y are points that minimize f of z minus y transpose z. Let's just apply that idea here. Okay, subgradients of g at a point u are a times subgradients of f star at minus a transpose u. Okay, but um, that's exactly, that such an x is something that, that minimizes f of z minus negative the a transpose u transpose z, which is plus u transpose az. Okay, so we've just used um, that, that property, right? That, uh, In other words, we just use the x, let's say, is in the subgradient 
of f star at the point minus a transpose u is true if and only if x actually minimizes over all z f of z minus this quantity a transpose u transpose z right which is what we have up what we have up on the slides. Okay, so once we have such a point, we get a subgrade right of the dual criterion, and then we move in the direction of that subgrade. Okay, um, actually the dual criterion is not exactly that, right, because we actually have this term still. So the subgrade in that with respect to u is b. So subgrades of the full criterion are a times x, where x is such a point minus b. Okay, so now if we're doing subgradient ascent on the dual, the dual subgradient method, we basically are repeating this over and over again. Okay, u gets the value to have the four plus the step size times the subgrade of the dual criterion. But for this, remember, we're actually able to compute that then in place. <coughs> Okay, the subgrade in the dual criterion is first gotten by solving a minimization problem in the original function, multiplying that by a and subtracting b. Okay, so ax minus b is a bona fide subgrade of the dual criterion, thanks to our equivalences that we established. Okay, but it's kind of nice, right? Because there's no there's no appearances of f star anywhere here. But and this is this is literally uh, subgrading on the dual. If f is strictly convex, right, then this changes in a minor way, but um, it's worth pointing out. If f is strictly convex, then remember we, we saw that imply that f star was differentiable, which means that this thing is actually the gradient. ax minus b is the gradient, because there's somehow it's uniquely determined, right, which means it's only one x that actually minimizes uh, this inner optimization problem, the f of x plus the previous u transpose ax. So we can write x is equal to the argument, whereas before we had x is just anything. And so uh, here we actually could somehow choose um, these step sizes now in standard ways for gradient descent, which are different than for subgradient descent. So that would be the, or I guess ascent in this case, that would be the other difference between these two methods, right? Difference in choosing step sizes. And indeed, uh, pro between proximal gradient applying acceleration, it turns <coughs> over as you learned before, because just to reiterate, this is nothing more than dual ascent, gradient ascent. Okay, it's just guys in, uh, in this form because it looks a little bit different because instead of writing explicitly the gradient of f star, we've expressed it in this form, ax minus b, where x minimizes this. Okay. So that's, I think, kind of neat when you see that for the first time. Maybe it's surprising that you can still do dual optimization without actually having the dual criterion. Um, let's talk about its convergence properties first. Let's just spend a very brief discussion of its convergence properties. So uh, there's a lot of neat properties that connect um, smoothness and convexity properties at f to smoothness and convexity properties at f star. We already saw some of them here, right? And we've proved this um, kind of more or less ex explicitly for first principles. So we see that strict convexity implies that uh, f star is differentiable and it's, it's gradient. In fact, commerce is also true. Differentiability of the conjugate implies strict convexity of f. And in fact, even more is true. Somehow even stronger equivalence is hold. That's what we're about to show here. We're about to show that strong convexity of f is equivalent to Lipschitzness of the graph of F star. Okay, that probably shouldn't be too surprising in the sense after you've seen this. Okay, it's a very natural pairing in some sense. So strong convexity certainly implies strict convexity, which should imply differentiability of F star, right, from this. But more than that, it actually implies, it implies that grad F star is Lipschitz. Okay, and, the, and then I, I have the proof here in the slides. Um, Maybe we'll go through this quickly because I don't think it's a very difficult proof. I just have admitted the other direction. I'll let you think about the other direction. So here I, I'm going to show that um, if f is strongly convex with parameter d, that implies that grad f is Lipschitz with parameter 1 over d. Okay, so um, 
Remember that if, f, uh, if a function g is strongly convex, then we have essentially a quadratic lower bound. Right? We know that, we, you guys proved this on homework one, in fact. The strong convexity right, implies that this is true. astronaut pen I was given as a present. It's supposed to never run out of ink. So, <laughs> bogus. Alright, so when, when uh, x is a minimizer of g, then, then this is true, right? Because the gradient of x is uh, 0. The gradient of g is 0 of x. Okay, in fact, um, this is true even when g is not smooth. This inequality is true even when g is not smooth. smooth. Yeah, we're not going to prove that, but you can find standard proofs of that um, in, in textbooks. Okay, so if g is strongly convex with parameter d, and it's minimized at x, then this is true for all y. <coughs> and now let's think about applying this. Let's apply this uh, to two functions. The first one is going to be, um, think about it this way, g of x is equal to f of x minus 2 transpose x. And the second one is g of x is equal to f of x minus b transpose x. Okay. Each of these functions have different minimizers. So this one is actually minimized at a point that I've denoted x u in the slide, which is equal to, what is it equal to? So remember, we, we know what minimizes this overall x when f is strictly convex. That is the gradient of f star at u. Remember that was true because it came from our first set of equivalences. And this one is minimized at x b, I'm calling, which is the gradient of f star at b. Okay, so then basically we can apply this fact to these two functions where x here is replaced by these minimizers for each of these functions. And we get two uh, inequalities. The first is that g of x um, at any point, g of, let's say, y at any point, is better than equal to g of x, where x is the minimizer, plus g over 2 times x minus y squared. Okay, remember the minimizer is denoted by x u. And for y here, for y, for the other point, I'm actually choosing a specific instance, which is x b. Yeah, just happen to pick x b because it's useful here. Applying that fact to now this function, f of x minus b transpose x, we get that you know g of y then is bigger than equal to g of x for the minimizer x plus d over 2 times y minus x squared. But the minimizer is x b. And now I happen to be applying it to the specific instance y equals x u. Okay, so these two just came from this fact and the fact that x u and x b minimize these two functions respectively. Add them together. So if we add them together, we get what? Um, if we add the inequalities together, we get that uh, right f of x v minus u transpose x v plus f of x u minus um, b transpose x u is bigger than or equal to f of x u minus u transpose x u plus um, f of x v minus b transpose x v 
plus, and we have two appearances of the same term, right? Just d times xu minus xd squared. Okay, so we have a bunch of common terms that we can cancel out on either side. Okay, now if we rearrange, we see that this implies that, um, let's for example move all of these terms over to the other side. Did I miss any? No, I didn't miss anything. So we, we get that uh, d times xu minus xd squared is less than or equal to, let's uh, collect the common terms here. I have u transpose um, xv plus u transpose xu plus u transpose xv plus v transpose xu. And now I can write this as, um, let's see, I want to write this as, uh, let's say u minus v, right, transpose, this should be xu minus xv. Okay, all the signs should work out here. Yeah, and I use Cauchy Schwartz here, the Cauchy Schwartz inequality, which tells me that this is less than or equal to uh, the norms of these two. Okay, and then therefore just by uh, let's say canceling out one of these, I see that uh, xu minus xb is less than or equal to 1 over d times u minus b. Okay, but that's exactly what I want for lipstickness, right? Because if you remember, these things are actually gradients of my um, conjugate function at u and b respectively. So this exactly says that f star is lipstick with constant 1 over d. Okay, so that was the proof of that direction. The other direction I'll leave as an exercise. It's not very different. Okay, so a bunch of neat facts that relate, um, like I said, smoothness and convexity properties of a function and its conjugate. Why are we going through these exercises? Well, actually, the first one was to derive this algorithm, right? We need to derive the relationships between subgradients of one and the other for this algorithm. But this one was actually to derive its convergence properties. So now we basically can, can just combine this fact, okay, that strongly convex to the parameter g is equivalent to the conjugate having a Lipschitz gradient with the parameter 1 over d. We can combine that fact with what we know about gradient descent. Okay, so what we know about gradient descent, right, is that it's, it converges at various rates, assuming, you know, various standard assumptions. So if f is strongly convex to the parameter b, then what we know is that um, the dual function, right, uh, f star, the conjugate, is Lipschitz with the parameter, has a Lipschitz gradient with parameter 1 over d, so we get this convergence rate. Right? To get an epsilon suboptimal solution, we get a convergence rate of 1 over epsilon. That just comes from what we already proved about gradient descent in our very first algorithms lecture. And if we know that f is strongly convex with parameter d and has a Lipschitz, and it's, it's differentiable and has a Lipschitz gradient with parameter L, that implies that the same two properties are true about f star, right? This guy uh, implies that f star has a Lipschitz gradient, and this guy implies that f star is actually itself strongly convex, right? And for the parameters, we just have 1 over d Lipschitz parameter for, for grad f star, and here we have 1 over L strong convexity parameter for f star. So if we take appropriate step sizes, then we get linear convergence. Again, from what we already know about gradient descent, and it converges at the right log of 1 over epsilon. Okay, so now we kind of have a complete understanding, let's say, of, um, of, these, of these dual methods as per our understanding of gradient descent originally. Okay, let me offer you guys a quiz. Um, something to think about, and then you know, if you're confused, you can come up and ask me after class or some other time. Take a look at this, okay? You see f is strongly convex with parameter d. This looks like a slow break for such a case, right? f is strongly convex with parameter d, dual gradient ascent, converts at the rate 1 over epsilon. Seems kind of like a slow rate, right? We assume that it's strongly convex with parameter d, and, and it's also Lipschitz, has a Lipschitz gradient. Then we get the linear rate. 
How does that differ from what we already proved about gradient descent in the primal? So that's the little place to think about. So, in other words, what happens if I gave you, forget about duality, I just gave you a function, I said it was strongly convex with the parameter, of, let's say, m. How fast would gradient descent converge, or the subgradient method converge? Think about that. Okay? And you can, you'll maybe see this is not so different from what you would expect. Okay, um, but maybe one thing to point out that's important is that all these results describe convergence of the dual objective to its optimal value. We haven't said anything about the primal here, okay? Because we're talking about applying our existing convergence results to the dual. So why is this useful aside? Um, why is this interesting aside from you know just being a neat fact about um, you know a function and its dual? Well, it's useful for the following reason. Um, we get something that's called generically called dual decomposition out of this uh, relationship. So let's suppose we're trying to minimize a function that's a sum of functions of blocks of variables. So I'm going to write my function f of x as a sum of f i of xi, where xi is a different disjoint block, sub-block of, of the full x variable. Okay? Um, but we have this kind of complicating equality constraint. Okay, something like ax equals b. We've actually kind of seen already why duality helps with this in the KKT lecture, but we never call it dual decomposition. We just saw a special instance of this. Okay, we're going to see that actually the method we just described is extremely useful for problems of this form because it allows us to decompose essentially the steps in the dual optimization. Whereas here, we can't really do that because that equality constraint kind of entangles all the primal variables together. We can't separately optimize over you know, each fi. So let's partition the columns of A according to uh, the partition of X that we have. Right? So what we're able to do then is we can write AX equals B as the equivalent to the sum of AI times XI equals B. Okay, the picture is just like this. Right? I have sum A and I'm going to partition its columns in the same way that I partition the uh, elements of x. Right, so by multiplying this by x, I can think about it just you know, decomposes into multiplying each block ai by a corresponding block of x. x and some of those so a very simple but powerful observation is that when we calculate the gradient or the subgradient, depending on whether we assume you know, this is convex or strictly convex, that decomposes into B separate optimization problems. Right? Because what we usually have is just we want to minimize f of x plus u transpose ax. Okay? Right? That's just what we usually have. But look what happens because of this form for A. When we're minimizing f of x plus u transpose ax, that's equivalent to minimizing the sum of f of xi plus uh, u transpose the sum of ai xi. Okay? And we can just pull the sum on the outside. just realize that actually this uh, can be decomposed, this is a minimum over x, right? Into a separate minimization problem for each xi. Because now with this criterion that we're trying to optimize in order to get the gradient or subgradient, it's the sum of b separate criterions, each in a different block of variables, xi. So that's all I've said here. To get this x plus that helps us, you know, that gives us the, the gradient and subgradient, we can actually optimize over different blocks of x directly. Just look at how uh, you know, our functions act on xi. fi of xi plus u transpose ai times xi. So it's supposed to say fi. So here's the algorithm then, right? We, the, the subgradient calculation, it actually decomposes, or the gradient calculation, again, depending on whether this is unique or not, it decomposes into B separate minimizations. Once we have those, we take the sum of AIXI, where XI is 
or, or the solutions here, subtract off B. That gives us the gradient or subgradient of the full criterion, and then we just move it, you know, in that direction to update U our dual variable. So we can think of these kind of generically in terms of two steps. How would we actually think about to implement this algorithm in a parallel or distributed fashion? The first is, you know, I have, let's say I have the current value of u, which I'm calling u k minus 1. I send that out to my b separate processors. Okay, a b separate processors. So that's why you see these u's uh, going out from, say, the central, central node here. Each of these processors performs one of these minimizations. It has the local, a local copy of the dual variable. It actually finds the xi that minimizes this local criterion, right? fi of xi plus u transpose ai xi. Once it's done, it sends that back to the central node. That's why you see each of these sending back a different x, like x1, x2, and x3. That's, that's the second step. That's this gather step, okay, this dual update step. You have all those. The central node basically just takes the sum of ai xi, subtracts off b, and then takes the step in that direction, which is the gradient or subgradient update. OK, so that's, um, that was a, this is a very old algorithm. I think it's uh, references traced back at least to the 60s. Um, and there's some very nice work that also kind of uh, has some interpretation in terms of prices, which I'll, I'll kind of uh, give you a hint at now. So here's, here's a version of it with um, inequality constraints. So we saw a version with equality constraints. So let's talk about the same thing for inequality constraints. So all I'm going to do the only difference between the previous one and this one is that I'm, I'm going to do a projected subgradient step or projected gradient step, depending on whether this is uh, you know convex or strictly convex. So I find in the, in the exact same fashion before, I find the subgradient or gradient. That's this guy right here. I take a step in the direction of that, but then, okay, because my dual variable has to be non-negative in each component because I have an inequality constraint, right? And my dual variable associated with that has to be a negative component. I have to project this onto the non-negative orthogonal. So all this plus operator means that you go through each component and you just take, uh, you push that to zero if it's negative, otherwise you take it out of this projected subgrade method, the projected gradient method. But you learn also converges and have this, all the same properties. Right? And again, just to repeat, I need this projection step because my dual variable now, I have an inequality constraint, must be non-negative in each component. Okay. Only changes this positive part. So how do we interpret that? It's actually kind of a rather neat interpretation from that. Um, and this, I think it's quite old, but I took it from uh, some writings of, of Vandenberg, who's the second author in the, in the Boyd and Vandenberg textbook. So you can think about this as follows. So we have, let's suppose, uh, B units in a system, okay? B units in a system, like B of these units, these nodes here. And each of these units has its own decision variable, we'll call that xi. So this one has x1, this one has x2, this one has x3. Okay? There are some constraints, though, on the shared resources. So each row of A tells us something about um, how much we can allocate to each of those decision variables. There are some constraints about how we can do so. Each row of A somehow tells us that you know the sum of like, all the decision variables has to be bounded by something, or you know these kind of constraints. Okay, and each uh, component of the dual variable, which is non-negative because they have an inequality constraint, you can think of as the price of resource J. Right? Every row of A corresponds to one of the resources. The constraint that um, AJ transpose X is less than or equal to DJ is a constraint on resource J. And uj, which is non-negative, is the price. You can think of it as the price of resource j. So what is the dual update then? The dual update you can just rewrite as for each variable j, uh, uj, for each component of the dual variable uj, the next value is uj minus t times sj. Take the positive part of that. Where SJ is uh, S is the 
are the residuals, the, the slats. It's what's left over after I take the constraints minus what I've currently gotten with my um, shared resource. Okay, it's B minus AX. That's just comes from rewriting this, right? Here I have AX minus B. We call that minus S in the next slide. That's it. So how do we interpret each component here? Well, in a very natural way. This says that um, if SJ is named, which means that the J resource is overutilized, we have something left over between the budget and how much we've actually allocated for resource J, SJ is named, then we're going to increase the price, right? UJ is going to get bigger because we're doing UJ minus something negative. If SJ is overutilized, okay, which means that actually we don't have uh, enough of that resource, right? Then, um, no, I'm sorry, it's underutilized, okay? Then we increase, if it's underutilized, then we decrease the price. I think I said this in a mixed up way. Let's start again. So if this is uh, negative, which means that we actually are using too much compared to how much is compared to the budget, okay, then the slack variable is negative. Then we increase the price, right? The price gets driven upwards because we're going UJ minus a negative quantity. If the resource is underutilized, which means this is actually positive, we have some, something left over in our budget, okay, then we're going to be doing UJ minus something positive, and the, the price goes down. Okay, it's a very natural notion of price balancing, and what does this do? The positive part just means that we can't have negative prices. Right? We're going to clip all the prices at zero. So there's some very nice like old work that interpret interprets this in the context of what these are called shadow prices. Um, it's a very old algorithm, but it, it, this experienced a kind of a great revival recently because combined with the an idea that we're about to show next, people realize this is actually a very practical method for parallelization and distributed computing. And that's what we're going to see in ADMM. Okay, so let's um Let's actually take a quick break and then I'll come back and I'll do augmented Lagrangian this place of stuff. Fully composition methods, classic stuff. Uh, if you'd like some references on the history of this stuff, the uh, uh, Steve Boyd and a bunch of co-authors have a nice monograph on ADMM, and which we'll learn. And in the kind of introduction to that monograph, they, they give a nice history of, of um, mm. dual decomposition, which is also a Dual decomposition and the yeah, augmented Lagrangian method. Okay, so slightly after dual decomposition is this method called uh, you know, augmented Lagrangian. It's also known as the method of multipliers. Um, and it's motivated by the following observation. So the, the disadvantage of dual ascent is that it requires very strong conditions to ensure convergence. So we didn't cover what these conditions were, but let me go back to this note. Okay, this describes convergence of the dual objective. Everything on the slide describes convergence of the dual objective. Okay, because we defer using facts we already proved about gradient descent, but on the dual problem. If you want to actually prove that, let's say, the x is here, converge to prime law points, or at least the criterion value that you saw on the x is converge to prime law points, that's actually much harder, requires much stronger conditions. The biggest issue the biggest issue is that there's nothing really about these steps, per se, that is strong enough to enforce um, feasibility with the x's. Okay? For example, we're not like projecting onto the primal constraints at every iteration. We don't actually have feasible x iterates at every iteration. And there's nothing somehow that's really strong enough in some sense to like, push us towards primal feasibility. So to get primal feasibility in the limit and to get primal convergence, uh, in this method requires much stronger assumptions than this. Okay, that's the, uh, the disadvantage of kind of generic uh, dual gradient methods. So that, that's what motivates this class of methods. It's called the method of multipliers, also known as the mental Lagrangian method, which came shortly after these dual methods. And the idea is very simple. The idea is just to essentially augment the primal problem by 
um, a strongly convexifying term, at least when A is, uh, is full column. Okay, and that term looks like this. It's just some parameter, which we call the mental Lagrangian parameter, rho, times the square distance between Kx and B. So notice that we haven't changed the problem at all, right? There's nothing at all that's different about this problem because at any feasible point, we have Ax equal to B, so this actually contributes nothing to the criterion whatsoever, you know, feasible point. And in fact, that's true no matter what rho is, right? So we're kind of free to choose rho sometimes for whatever we want. So it's clearly equivalent to the original problem, and we've just made the objective strongly convex, at least when A has full column rank. Okay, so what that means is that we've immediately put ourselves into this category. Okay, uh, or and let's say at least into the first category. Okay, uh, yeah, at least into the first category. Okay, um, so the idea then is just to use the same method as before, right? We're going to essentially then now calculate our written as an equality, assuming that uh, this actually makes the whole criterion strictly convex, this term. So let's just assume for simplicity that A is full column rank. This makes the whole criterion uh, strongly and therefore strictly convex, which means it has a unique minimizer, so that's why I wrote an equality here. So this is, this is what it is. Okay, it's just given by minimizing our criterion plus u transpose ax. So this is the additional term that appears. And then moving in the direction of that gradient, right, on the dual. And I've, I've, uh, I've done one other thing, actually, which made me caught, which is that I've actually fixed the step size to be rho. So whatever we happen to choose for the eventual Lagrangian parameter up here, I actually chose to have a step size of length rho equal to the eventual Lagrangian parameter. Okay, we'll, we'll see some um, motivation for that just now, but I'll let you guys just absorb the differences between this and before, which is just that you have this kind of extra augmented term. Okay, so why do I choose this step size tk equal to rho? Well, there's various ways to think about it. One way that I like that's, I think, kind of simple um, is to see that essentially by choosing that, we are trying to satisfy stationarity in the original primal problem. Okay, so um, this point xk is chosen to minimize this uh, augmented Lagrangian. f of x plus rho over 2 times ax minus b, that's our new criterion, right, augmented criterion, plus u transpose ax. So if xk were to minimize this, right, then it if we take a subgradient that's with respect to x, then that must contain zero. So that's all I've said here. Okay. Taking a subgradient that creates the criterion, it says that it must uh, contain zero. So the subgradient of f of, f of xk, so the point minimizes it, plus a transpose uh, the current u, that's what we get from here, plus a subgradient of this, right, with respect to x evaluated at xk. That's just nothing more than uh, rho times ax minus a transpose ax minus b, so I pull the a transpose out. And look at what we have here. If I actually chose rho to be the step size that I used in the next uh, update for u, then this is nothing more than uk. That's why we chose the step size to be rho, so we can make this statement. It's nothing more than uk. So this whole term collapses just to being uk under that choice of step size. So iteration k, look, we're trying to satisfy um, the KPT conditions for the original problem, and we've actually satisfied the stationarity conditions for the original problem. Okay? Taking a subgradient criterion and set it equal to zero. That's this original problem. This guy, okay? without the augmentation. That's the stationary condition for that problem. So all that we need, right, is uh, primal feasibility. We need this to be going to zero. Once we have that, then we actually have the KPD condition satisfied for the original problem, so we have solutions to the original problem. So that this augmentation actually, as we kind of can see from this bit of motivation, it helps dramatically uh, to ensure convergence under weaker conditions. So there are some mild conditions, like um, essentially I think it's just convexity and closedness of of f, uh, and I don't, I don't even think that a needs to be a full column rank to make this true, although it makes the argument simpler. And under those conditions, we get that uh, we get primal feasibility in the limit, 
the stationarity conditions are satisfied at every iteration. So what you can show then is that uh, the primal iterates propose approach optimality instead of the dual iterates. Okay, so much stronger convergence properties than we got from just the uh, dual gradient method by itself. So that's the advantage, and that's why people were looking at this shortly after um, dual methods. There's a big disadvantage though, and that's that we lose decomposability. Okay, so if we go back to a problem like this, right, like this one, now we have a term that looks like plus rho over 2 times the L2 norm of ax minus b squared. That L2 norm prevents us from making this decomposition, right, because that does not separate into some of terms that involve xi. That again kind of tangles all the xi variables together. So we don't get this nice decomposition feature. Okay, um, that brings us to a method called ADMM, which tries to get the best of both roles. So the nice convergence properties of a Bentley Lagrangian or method of multiply methods, along with decomposability. And you know, maybe um, conversely to what you may think, this is not a new method either. This method is pretty much just as old as the method of, of mental Lagrangian. I think it's the 70s in which maybe this was first explicitly formulated in the way that I'm going to show here in the slides. But there are lots of very related algorithms that occurred kind of throughout the literature much earlier. Okay, it's, um, we won't come up, somehow give like a really detailed treatment of how this connects to lots of other methods, but this ends up being equivalent to a method called douglas rackford splitting and it's equivalent to a bunch of other operator splitting methods, and these are all very old. It just gained a lot of popularity recently um, because people realized it was a really kind of useful, flexible framework for a lot of optimization problems that we cared about, that we care about. Okay, so all this stuff is really old, but um, relevant to, to modern problems. So for, with ADMM, we consider solving problems of this form. Okay, so minimize, let's say, f of x plus g of z, subject to ax plus bc equals c. So I just switched notation slightly, so I didn't call the blocks x1 and x2, and I didn't call the function blocks f1 and f2 and a1 and a2. I just used this simple notation. Okay, f of x plus g of z, subject to ax plus bc equals c. Okay, that's our problem that we're going to consider. And we can consider sums of many, uh, you know, sums of criteria in many blocks of variables as well, and we'll do that next time. We'll talk about um, something called consensus ADMM and other versions of ADMM that help us deal with uh, like multiple blocks. So the two block case is the simplest. So what we do is um, we have the augmented objective, just like we did in the method of the augmented Lagrangian. So we add this term, which is uh, you know, our, our linear term that defines the equality constraint, ax plus pz minus c. That, the two norm of that squared times some parameter rho over 2 to the objective. And just to reiterate, as before, this did nothing in this essentially to change the set of solutions to the problem because, uh, you know, again, at feasibility, that term is just zero. So we haven't changed the problem at all. And that's true for any parameter row. So we have this kind of free parameter sitting around called the augmented Lagrangian parameter. And I'm just going to switch notation a little bit because um, it helps simplify the steps, although it's exactly the same as what you saw before. I'm going to, going to define the augmented Lagrangian to be the criterion right, plus the, um, the usual dual multiplier. You transpose the equality constraint, and then this is the augmented bit. So this is called the augmented Lagrangian because this is the usual Lagrangian right, without this piece. And now this is the, this is what I've written down as the augmented Lagrangian. In other words, it's the Lagrangian for this problem, for the augmented problem. So ADMM repeats the following steps. It does uh, a, a kind of sequence of block updates, x and z. Um, and then it, it does a dual update. So first, it, up, it minimizes the Lagrangian over just the x variables with z, the other block of primal variables, fixed at its current value, and u, the dual variables, fixed at their current value. And it called, let's call it xk. Then it minimizes Lagrangian over just the z block of primary variables, with the, the, u, the dual variable u being fixed at its current value, and x also being fixed at its newest value. This is extremely important. So this is the difference between a you know, conversion algorithm generally and a non-conversion algorithm generally, whether or not we put in the new x or the old x. 
The same is true with, with blockwise coordinate descent or coordinate descent. It's a very minor rotational detail, but it's extremely important to emphasize. This is the new value of xk. Okay, it's not the, um, not the previous value, not, not xk minus 1. Okay, so we optimize over x, take the, the newest value, put that back in, optimize over z, take both of the two newest values, compute the, uh, like the gradient right, of the dual objective, that's ax plus bz minus c, take a step in that direction with step length rho, just like we do with the eventual Lagrangian method. Okay, we, take, we fix the, the step size effectively in the dual gradient update just to be rho, the eventual Lagrangian parameter. So how does this differ from the original augmented Lagrangian method, okay, which is also called the method of multipliers, right? The one that we saw just previously. That method would have done a joint minimization over x and z, right? Because we have to somehow minimize our criterion over the primal variables to get the proper gradient for the dual. That's just, in this notation, minimizing over x and z jointly. So ADM helped us out by allowing us to decompose that into two separate minimizations. So as per right now, you know, you might look at this and think, this doesn't look very useful because I can't actually do this in parallel, right? I just told you you couldn't in general because you need the newest value of x before you do this, right? So maybe it looks like I've made a big hoopla out of nothing and ADMM at best saves us in the sense that, it helps us out in the sense that we have to do two smaller minimizations in the place of one bigger one, but they still have to be sequential. So that's true in this notation. Okay, but what we're going to see next time, I guess I won't have time to go through it before the end of today, is that there's a lot of flexibility for most problems into how you set up these equality constraints. So just like I said when we derived duals, we can kind of play tricks with setting them up in a way that we saw was fruitful, derive the duals and end up being fruitful. We can introduce equality constraints into problems that don't have equality constraints, but only have some, in such a way that actually these things can parallelize. Okay, that's called consensus ADM. We'll talk about that next time. So don't be discouraged by this general form. This is like the way to think about ADMM is that it breaks up this minimization into two sequential minimizations, but we can often get this to work in our favor by setting up the equality constraints in a clever way. Okay. Um, quickly, I guess I have a little less than 10 minutes. Uh, let me just go through some of the basics of ADMM, an example, and the next time we'll do a much more thorough treatment of ADMM. So, under very modest assumptions on F and G, these are essentially the same assumptions that you need for the augmented Lagrangian method to converge with, with the same, essentially to the same degree. What I believe is just that um, they're closed and convex. Uh, maybe that this problem admits strong duality. Okay, it has to, you know, satisfy strong duality. Uh, and I don't think A and B, I, this I'm sure of, they do not need to be full column rank okay, in order to get these conditions. So these equality constraints here could actually have rank deficient matrices A and B. Then we're guaranteed that for any um, augmented Lagrangian parameter, for any choice of row whatsoever, we have to fix any fixed choice of row. We get uh, that the primal Earth's approach feasibility, okay, AX minus B minus C goes to zero as we run the algorithm. The primal uh, objective converges to the optimal value. So f of x plus g of z converges to, this should say, sorry, f star plus g star. So that's the type here. Interestingly enough, um, and this is not an artifact of analysis, I believe this is a real, somehow, property of the method. Although, I, you know, maybe further uh, work on ADM will prove me wrong. We get actually a stronger condition in the dual, which is we get that the dual iterates themselves converge to an optimal solution. So not only does the dual objective converge, the iterates themselves converge to a solution. And they're kind of quite weak assumptions on F and G. Um, and there's many proofs of this, date back to the 70s. Uh, this monograph by Steve Boyd and many co-authors proves it uh, from first principles directly. It's the, the level of arguments there is something you can certainly understand, having taken um, you know, the optimality and duality lectures in this class, and the facts essentially stem from the stuff we learned at the start of this lecture, right? The relationships between F and F star in terms of smoothness and convexity. So you can check that out if you'd like to see the proof. Uh, and very interesting thing.
thing to mention is the convergence rate of ADMM. So it's not known in general. Um, there's a lot of people currently actively working on developing precise convergence rates for ADMM. And I would say that the consensus idea is that it roughly behaves like a first order method or probably a bit faster. Okay, but, but on par, most of the time, it's first order methods. And I'll show you a couple of experiments in the but numerical experiments on Monday that support that. But um, developing precise convergence rates is actually very tricky for ADMM. So there's a bunch of papers here um, that do so. For example, this paper shows that it has a linear convergence rate, so versus the rate log of 1 over epsilon, provided that one of these two functions is strongly convex. Okay, it's kind of nice. If uh, f or g is strongly convex, you get linear convergence for ADMM. Okay, it's a little bit better than what we know with, say, pure gradient descent, unless we know the proximal operator of one of the other guys, um, which is essentially what's assumed in this proof, because we're assuming that the updates can be done exactly. But, uh, but so I guess you can think about it like roughly on par with first order methods, but not really known precisely. So if I give this lecture again in the future year, or someone else gives this lecture, this may change. Maybe there's a general, uh, you know, state of a general theorem we can present for ADMM and its convergence rate. So before we leave, I uh, want to just describe a different form of the ADMM update that's very useful and then an application to a very old problem. Um, and the form is called scaled form. So it's often much easier to express the ADMM updates in a slightly different uh, manner than what I did in this slide. And that's just to introduce a variable w that actually plays the role of a scaled dual variable u over rho. So w itself is not the dual variable, not, not the variable that's associated with the dual criterion. It's just a scaled version of that. So in that parameterization, you can uh, check that the ADMM steps are exactly these ones. Okay, the updates are of the form, uh, the x update is of the form f of x plus the yeah, mental Lagrangian term. Uh, you know, the row over 2 times the norm of AX, minus, AX plus BG minus C plus now the dual variable, scale dual variable squared. Same with the, the Z update, it's G of Z plus the same term, but for now, right, Z is the optimization variable. And then we don't have to introduce a row here. Okay, the, the scale dual variable just gets its value before plus the residual AX plus BZ minus C. So why is that the case? Let's just check that for, um, say, the X update. Everything else will be similar. So if I did something like this, okay, just expand this with respect to, sorry, expand this term. Okay, and what I get is as follows. AX plus BZ minus C squared plus WK minus 1 squared. Okay, but this I don't care about because it depends on X, right? It's minimization over X. This already looks like the mental Lagrangian term we had before. And what's the cross term? The cross term is uh, 2 times rho over 2 times the inner product between WK minus 1 transpose AX plus BZ minus C. But now, look at this. This, this thing here, right, this is just equal to rho times WK minus 1, which is equal to U. Right, if we were to think about our original notation, so well, that's just U. So then, this is actually exactly the same as before, right? This is the dual multiplier, you transpose the residual. This is the augmentation term. So we're performing the same step. I think that scale form is just easy to remember because now, essentially, you just take the original criterion, you add to it a term which is the square two norm times rho over two times the, whatever the inequality constraint was, plus the dual variable. That's the only thing you have to worry about adding. I think it's much easier to remember. And the same thing for the Z update. Okay, and then there's, there's no, like I said, there's no row that appears at all in the, the W update. Okay.
Uh, something that we'll maybe emphasize next time also is that in this form, the, uh, the scale do, do it or it's just a running sum of residuals. That's going to be helpful when we talk about consensus agent money. But we'll skip that for now. So let's go through one example and then we'll just uh, end for the day. So let's go back to a problem we studied when we talked about the subgrading method, which is just finding the point, finding a point in the intersection of two convex sets. Okay, so suppose C and D are convex sets. Yes, let's also suppose they're close. And consider solving this optimization problem. Minimize over all x, the indicator of the, of the set C at x plus the indicator of the set D at x. Okay, when this is zero, we found a point in both sets. And it's infinity otherwise, right, if x is not in both sets. So, supposing that they have an intersection, minimizing this problem is actually finding the point in their intersection. So to get this into you know, what we might call ADMM form, a form that we can apply, to which we can apply ADMM, we're going to just introduce an equality constraint by sticking a z in the indicator function for d, okay? keeping x in the indicator function for c, and then introducing the constraint that x equals z, or x minus z is equal to 0. It's a very common trick that we'll play. This is just like the most simple example of it. We'll have, a, we'll have a problem that doesn't have constraints, but only has some constraints. we are introduced a bunch of constraints because we know that by doing so, the resulting ADM updates will be easy. Okay, we kind of look ahead and think, what constraints could we introduce to disentangle the various parts of the problem so that the ADM updates are easy? And after we do that, we write them down, and you know, that's, that's the algorithm that we use. So um, what is the ADM algorithm here? The X update is to minimize the indicator of x, that's our f of x, plus rho over 2 times x minus zk minus 1 plus wk minus 1. So that's the x update for this problem, right? So the minimizer is just the, look, this is going to be infinity if, if we're outside of c. So this is like minimizing this criterion, rho doesn't matter at all, minimizing this criterion, right, over all points in the set C. But that's nothing more than just projecting, um, you know, whatever this point is, onto the set C. So it's the projection of CK minus 1 minus WK minus 1 onto the set C. That is the, the X update. So the Z update is also just given by the projection down to the set D of, it should be uh, X, let's say K, plus WK minus 1. See if I got that right. Yeah, that's right. right. From the same argument, basically, just for the Z update. Then, then the dual update W is just, you know, the usual simple update. This one. Take the difference. Add that to what you were before. So this is like the alternating projections method, but it's with the dual variable. So what, what have we learned before? When we saw the subgrading method applied to this problem, we saw it reduced to alternating projections. You project the current point on C, you project that point on D, you project that point on C, etc. That's very similar to this method, except for we have now a W, a dual variable in this method, or a, dual, a scale dual variable. If we didn't have W, it would be alternating projections. But now we have a dual variable, and it's uh, not exactly alternating projections, but if you draw yourself a picture, you can actually, it's kind of neat, convince yourself why you think this would be more efficient. So this dual variable actually helps, you can see intuitively when you draw yourself a picture, um, let's say speed up the conversions of this alternating projections-like scheme. And in fact, it is much more efficient. So um, if you implemented this in, alternating, in pure alternating projections, you see this actually converge much faster. The difference between ADM and subgrading consent. Um, and I, I believe that there's some history associated with this problem as well. Um, and that this, this kind of type of dual update is associated with a method people call Dijkstra's method for uh, finding the a point in intersection of sets. It may be either exactly Dijkstra's method or very similar to it. I can't quite remember. Yeah. Okay, so that was an, just an example of ADM. We'll go through lots more examples for more sophisticated problems on Monday. And I will see you guys then. Just a reminder that your milestones are due on Friday, um, so make sure to turn those in. Milestone 2.